All right, happy Friday. Welcome back, Attorney Steve Vondra. And hey, is it true that imitation is the best form of flattery? Well, I used to think so too, but in this case, we have a law firm going up against another law firm in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, and this is Manhattan area, I believe. Um, but here we have a law firm suing another for plagiarism, basically bringing it as a copyright infringement action for allegedly copying a motion, a legal motion, if you can believe it. So um, lawyers write motions. Motions can often take, you know, hours and hours to write to get a nice persuasive motion with lots of different um, arguments and case law and putting all that together. Well, here, uh, the defendant, Winston and Strawn, this is a giant, giant uh, law firm, is alleged to have copied plaintiff's brief, one of their briefs, and the plaintiff is now bringing this as a copyright infringement action. I'll save you all the details here. I'll post it on my website if you want to check it out, the case, read all the facts. But in essence, they're saying you copied one of our legal briefs. You can't just do that. And so after uh, the plaintiff filed their motion, their brief, the other party, uh, the other law firm copied it and, post, and, po and filed it with the court. So the plaintiff went and then registered the copyright with the copyright office. And now, as you can see here, the maximum statutory damage for copyright infringement, if it's willful, is $150,000. So now they're seeking $150,000 saying, hey, you copied my brief. It's strikingly similar here. And um, this is infringement and we want damages. We want statutory damages or actual damages. So um, this is a really interesting case because there really is, as far as I have searched, there's not really much about um, uh, plagiarism being actionable as a copyright infringement. But they did register a copyright, which makes me wonder, can you copyright a legal brief that you're filing with the court because really it's full of facts and ideas and you're trying to persuade the court as to your point of view um, is that we know in academia that's the death knell you know you lose your job for plagiarism if a student plagiarizes another document um, from another student or you know that is considered grounds for discipline but is it is it a copyright infringement to do that um, we are going to find out, apparently, in this case. I have a strong sense that this will probably settle, so we probably will never get the final case law out of this. But here you see they're seeking uh, copyright infringement damages against the defendant, actual damages, and um, statutory damages. So you, you get to seek either as a copyright plaintiff, actual damages, or statutory damages, plus they're seeking reasonable attorney fees. So this will be interesting to see, demand for jury trial. Let's go down here. If you want to look it up, um, it's, uh, it's here if you want to look and see uh, how it was alleged to have been infringed. Here's one motion. They show the other motion. I'm not going to spend too much time going through all that, but if you want to read it, I'll post it on my website. Here is a copyright certificate of registration. This is what it looks like when you register a copyright. There's a registration number. So after they found the infringement, they went and recorded, uh, registered rather, the copyright. And so there's, they said, well, usually, and I'll just tell you this from my, my point of view as a copyright lawyer, usually you have to register your copyright before you find the infringement. But um, let, let's go down here. It, it kind of dis it describes it a little bit better down here. So there's the, there was the copying, the, your motion, my motion. Sorry, I'm going so fast here. Um, but, you know, so they're saying you copied it and it's strikingly similar and geez, why don't you do your own work? And, you know, um, you know, and this also kind of comes in line with what I have seen. You know, I used to look up ghostwriting. I had a few people say, hey, can you just ghostwrite a document for me? And I said, oh, you know, I, I had to check the rules on that. And it looked like, you know, courts, the, the judges in the courts, they want to they want to know who's writing the brief. So um, I think maybe there is uh, some other issues here that may need to be explored, which is why I do think it will probably settle. But, um, you know, it's just, it's just uh, real interesting because ABA has some rules, the American Bar Association. So there are some questions in this case I see other people raising. Is this ethical? Even if it's not a copyright infringement, is it ethical? 
to copy somebody's brief without telling the court, hey, this is their brief, kind of a ghostwriting situation. So that's something that I think is a key issue to look at. Is this fair use? Is this some type of fair use of somebody else's work? Could it save your client's uh, costs and money? Maybe that's a good thing. But again, I would like to know, well, what did the defendant charge? How much did they bill their client if they just cut and pasted? If I were the plaintiff, I would want to see what they charge their client. And if they're charging their client, you know, 10 billable hours when they just cut and pasted something, you know, and made some minor changes, let's say, you know, is that proper? So there are some buried issues here. But here is the notice of infringement that this was sent to the law firm. This is the plaintiff here. He writes to the defendant, I write with great regret that despite my repeated attempts at least four times to engage in discussions regarding a potential amicable resolution for the copyright infringement matter, you have chosen not to respond. Uh, following our disconnection on WeChat, I'm reaching out once more to explore the possibility of resolving this outside of the judiciary. So they showed their copyright registration. Here it is, DDD. Uh, as an experienced intellectual property attorney, you are undoubtedly aware that replicating another's legal brief does not constitute fair use. So they cite a California Central District case, New Egg, the New Egg case, and some other things and say, you know, you, you, you can't just do this. This is not a fair use, so forth. They suggested, hey, why don't you give us a call? Maybe we can settle something out here. Um, so then later, they finally got the response from Winston and Strawn. Uh, here they are out of Chicago, one of their offices. And the um, anyway, they said, hey, I write on behalf of Winston Strawn. In response to your November 30, 2023 letter, you noticed copyright infringement, DDD. By way of factual background, I understand on August 23, 2023, your firm filed a motion to dismiss, a motion in an, in an action caption, DDD. I further understand Winston filed its own motion the next day and that you claim that Winston's motion copied your motion. A week after your firm filed the motion and obtained a copyright registration for the pleading, and now you threaten to sue Winston for copyright infringement. So the point of their letter, their response letter, is you're not going to get 150000 You did not obtain the registration until after the alleged copying. Therefore, you can only recover statutory damages if the motion was published before the registration and publication has its own meaning here, as you can see distribution of copies of work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental lease or lead, uh, uh, lending. And they say if the act of filing a motion does not offer a work to the public for sale, rental, or lease. So in other words, you're not going to get that. Um, you filed your copyright too late and you can only therefore seek um, actual damages according to their response here. So even for the sake of argument, statutory damages were available. You could never recover anywhere near the 150,000 you suggest. Again, first statutory damages are limited to 30,000 for non-willful. So apparently they were claiming, well, this would be non-willful. Seems pretty willful for me in my opinion. It seems very willful to just cut and paste something. I don't know how that would be deemed non-willful. That's interesting to me. Um, Willful infringement requires that plaintiff show that the defendant was actually aware of the infringing activity. How could they not be? I mean, in my opinion, how could they not be? Or two, that the defendant's actions were the result of a reckless disregard for or willful blindness to copyright holders' rights. This is what we call turning a blind eye, okay? So, um, you know, you could judge for yourself. I have my own opinions on that. As a result, then they try to claim that this could be seen as innocent infringement, it would be as little as $200, if it was innocent, but again, you, you can uh, do the math yourself. Does this sound something innocent to you? Uh, but I'll leave that for the court. Um, anyway, every other factor informing that statutory damages analysis mandates only a minimal ward, if any, DDD, da da da. So you can see their response and uh, a little bit about fair use being, you know, some, some of the unsettled areas of law. That's why we do fair use opinions. They're not always easy to figure it out. Um, and we do not believe a court will welcome your request to use the copyright law to interfere with a lawyer's representation of its client, especially where the lawyer could have accomplished the same litigation strategy by just joining in on the motion. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, again, is this copyrightable? Is this a creative work of authorship? 
um, in, in a motion? Is that something, you know, it's really facts and laws and some persuasion mixed in there? Um, here's a little something on Winston and Strawn. Uh, for you new budding lawyers here, take, take note. Um, in the interview, uh, Tom Fitzgerald recently spoke with the American lawyer. He discussed the firm's 2022 revenue. He told, uh, he told that Winston grossed $1.146 billion, that's B as in biscuit, $1.146 billion while increasing profits by p- per partner by 4% to whew, $3.143 million. Whew. Wow. So if you're looking for a firm and partner track, that's a, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good uh, take there. Anyway, guys, we'll keep a track on this. I, I suspect it will be settled. I suspect there will be a settlement payment. And, um, but maybe not. You never know that maybe this could be litigated because there really is not a lot of, I, don't, I haven't found any precedent in the legal area that, you know, copying the law or, you know, cut and pasting law from a, you know, you know, it's law. Law is facts and, and it's case law. And is that a fair use? So um, very interesting case. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Have yourselves a great Friday. This is general legal information only and not legal advice. And uh, make sure you subscribe and we may be able to update you if anything happens in this case. So have a great day, everybody. Copyright lawyer, attorney Steve Vondren, attorneysteve.com. Bye now. General legal information only and not legal advice.